Uh, good morning, uh, Steve. Uh, I will just uh, briefly introduce you. Dr. Steve Rothenberg is currently the Chief of Pediatric Surgery at the Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical Center, Denver, Colorado, and also holds the post of Chairman of the Department of Pediatrics at the Rocky Mountain Hospital for Children. He also is a Clinical Professor of Surgery at the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. So he is uh, wearing a lot of hats in addition to his uh, clinical responsibilities as a, a pediatric surgeon and uh, uh, as a mentor and uh, one of the most popular pediatric thoracoscopic surgeons. So I will ask uh, Dr. Steve Rothenberg to go ahead and give his uh, talk on basics of thoracoscopy in infants and children. Steve, it's over to you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm sorry I can't be there with you, but uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, this morning, before we started uh, with the cases, I just wanted to cover some of the basics of thoracoscopy that I think are important in, as you try to deal with more uh, complicated lesions. Is it? Yeah. Sorry, we have a lot of background noise. Um, I think the most, one of the first key things is to make sure that you have adequate preoperative evaluation. So, uh, depending on what kind of lesion you're dealing with, it's important to get the right imaging studies to help you plan the surgery. So, for many things, just a routine chest x-ray is all we need. Uh, often, I think for congenital lung lesions or uh, severe uh, acquired lung lesions, it's very helpful to have a CT scan to evaluate the extent of the disease to help you plan your procedure. We're getting more and more uh, MRIs and MRAs, especially when we're dealing with uh, neurogenic tumors, um, to try and help us evaluate and plan for the appropriate surgery. And then, um, you know, if we're dealing with esophageal lesions, it's always great to have a barium swallow to help us uh, document the, the anatomy of the esophagus. And then other workup, really, we're in, in infants, we're not, uh, we're not as, uh, don't have to be as thorough in, in terms of physiologic workup as I think we do in adults. But it can be helpful to have pulmonary function studies in older children to determine how they're going to tolerate a thoracoscopy or single lung ventilation. Um, it's also uh, helpful often to have an echocardiogram to determine if there's any um, car uh, congenital cardiac defects which might affect what we do. But usually that's not a rate limiting step and in fact the child that we did the uh, TOF in yesterday had both an ASD and VSD uh, but the child tolerated the procedure um, relatively well. So what are the indications for thoracoscopic procedures in children? Well as you can see I think just basically every operation that we do as pediatric surgeons uh, is an appropriate indication to do thoracoscopically and basically uh, with the exception of uh, very few lesions, we now approach all of these thoracoscopically and try to avoid a thoracotomy um, in all procedures. You want to okay. All right. Uh, the thoracoscopic procedure extremely well. Can, sorry. Um, you know, one is if the patient has significant hemodynamic instability that's requiring significant pressor support. So I, we will do a thoracoscopic procedure on a patient who might be on low doses of dopamine, but if they're, um, if they're requiring significant levels of uh, pressor support, then probably insufflating the chest and collapsing a lung isn't going to work. Um, Non-conventional ventilator support. Uh, meaning children who are requiring high frequency uh, ventilation or oscillating ventilators um, can be a contraindication, although we have done thoracoscopic procedures on those patients. And then patients who can't be transferred from the ICU um, are, are patients that we think very hard about doing thoracoscopy, although I will show you um, in later talks that we actually have performed thoracoscopy up in the, uh, in the unit. I think it's very helpful um, in doing these procedures if you have a room that's set up um, to do specifically endoscopic surgery because it really helps with the ergonomics. Um, these are pictures of the new operating rooms that we just opened at, at my new hospital, um, the Rocky Mountain Hospital for Children, and this is certainly the high end of what you can have. The hanging monitors, HD, allows you really to set up the patient in an ergonomic position. But even if you don't have that, if you're working off a tower, um, 
with a, with a, a basic setup, it's still very important to set things up so that they're the most ergonomic uh, for you to perform procedures. And so the room setup for thoracoscopy is, is critical. And whereas when we do open thoracotomies, often the surgeon and the assistant are on separate sides of the table. Uh, in this case, it's actually critical that the surgeon and the assistant um, be on the same side of the table. And in general, the assistant is the one who's running the camera. And it's very important that both the surgeon and the assistant are in line with the camera, looking at the pathology, then looking at the monitor. Uh, because that creates the most ergonomic position for you to be in. If the assistant is on the opposite side of the table, it means that they're trying to run the camera in a paradox. They're actually looking against the camera and trying to give you the view you need to do these very uh, meticulous and fine dissections, and that's extremely hard to do. And so the surgeon and the assistant must be on the same side, and again, must be lined up looking at the pathology with the monitor in front of that so everything is, is working. In, uh, in the States, we talk about setting things up like it's a baseball diamond. Uh, you, and here it would be a little bit more like a cricket, cricket pitch, but you really, want, uh, you really want things set up to, to allow you to do the, the most ergonomic movements. Then positioning is very important in thoracoscopy. And as opposed to um, open thoracotomies, where basically every patient is put in a lateral decubitus position, that's not what you want to do when you're doing thoracoscopy. You want to position the patient so you maximize the exposure of the area you're trying to work on. And you want to use gravity to retract the lung um, if, if you're doing an anterior or posterior mediastinal mass. It gives you better exposure and it also allows you to use less ports so you're not wasting an instrument or a port to have to retract the lung out of the way. You also want to be sure that you have adequate access for your trocars. And you don't want to set the patient up thinking about, well, what am I going to do if I have to convert to an open thoracotomy? Um, we, you know, there are times when we'll all have to convert. We all know how to convert to an open thoracotomy, and we can all do it rapidly if we need to. Um, but if you position a patient in a lateral decubitus position just because you're worried about converting to an open thoracotomy, you're really setting yourself up to fail with the thoracoscopic procedure, uh, and you really need to maximize um, what you're trying to do so you can accomplish your goal. So a lateral decubitus position. Generally, I use that for a lung biopsy, for doing a lobectomy, which you'll get a chance to see this morning, or a decortication where you're really trying to get access to all parts of the chest, and so you want the patient up in a lateral decubitus. Um, for, um, I use a modified supine position, as you see here, uh, when we're dealing with an anterior mediastinal mass, um, we're doing something like a thymectomy, a uh, pericardial window or an aortopexy. And what this does is the positioning it gives us between the anterior and posterior axillary lines to put our trocars, but gravity retracts the lung out of the way and we have clear ac access to that, um, to that anterior mediastinum. And then we use a modified prone position if we're doing a posterior mediastinal mass um, or something like a TOF a, a Heller's myotomy, a PDA ligation, or a spine exposure, anything where we're trying to get access to that posterior mediastinum. And again, this positioning allows the lung to fall out of the way and give us exposure. Um, it's then, I think, helpful if you're doing something in the posterior mediastinum to place either a nasogastric tube or a bougie, or perhaps in some cases a, a flexible esophagoscope, so that you can have, know where the esophagus is and, and feel the relationships so that you don't injure any structures inadvertently. So this, for instance, is how we approach a, a TF or a TOF. Again, the patient is in a modified prone position. The, the right side is elevated about 30 degrees. And then the trocar position, and what you can see here is that I always try to triangulate. I always try to have my scope looking down on my working ports. And this is a 30 degree scope, and I'm looking down on my instruments so that it replicates what I do when I do open surgery, meaning that I'm looking down on my hands. And it also prevents instrument dueling. If you put the scope lower, um, if you were to put the scope down here and your other port out here, then your scope would be fighting with your instruments. And so you really want that sort of bird's eye view uh, that you can get. 
The instrumentation, um, and I realize that depending on where you are and what your resources are, it can be difficult to get. But if you're going to do things like, try to do things like um, TOF repairs or lobectomies in neonates, it's very important to have appropriate instrumentation. And so it's important to have um, four and three millimeter short scopes, um, 18 to 20 centimeters in length. I rarely ever use a zero degree scope anymore, almost always a 30 degree scope. Um, and the, a four millimeter wide angle 30 degree scope is, is my favorite scope that we use in most of these cases. It gives us a full screen picture. It gives excellent clarity. Um, and again, it allows you to look down on your instruments. It's very important to have three millimeter instruments um, and here you see a set made by Stortz, and that's what we'll be using a lot of today. But these are fully rotate, they're insulated, and they have all the tips that we use. It's very difficult to do something as fine as a TOF if you're using a long scope and long instruments because your arms end up being way out here. It's very difficult to do the fine motions that you need to do the dissection and the, and the suturing. Um, camera, you know, it's very, you need to have a good camera, either a three chip or, or digital. All, you know, all of our cameras now are going to HD. It's very important to have a good light source and light cord. You can lose a lot of light if your light cord um, is frayed. Uh, and so, and especially when you're using these small scopes, light, um, light illumination and retrieval is very important and a bad cord or a weak light source will cause problems. And then we need special energy sources that can facilitate what we're doing. Now you can deal with tissues and veins and arteries all with standard suturing techniques, uh, but it really is made much easier if you have some of these other devices if they're available to you. Anesthesia, um, for many of these procedures, it's helpful to have single lung ventilation. Unfortunately, most of our patients are too small for a double lumen endotracheal tube. Other options include using a bronchial blocker, um, or what we prefer to use in most cases is simply a main stem intubation of the contralateral side. So if we're do doing a left lower lobectomy, we just put the endotracheal tube down the right main stem bronchus. And this actually works quite well. It's quite quick um, and it, it can save a lot of time. And, and then we also use CO2 insufflation to help collapse the lung and that, that together really um, gives us excellent visualization. There are some cases where you can just use CO2 alone. Um, for instance, when we do a TOF repair, we no longer try to do a main stem intubation. We leave the endotracheal tube in the trachea, and the goal there is just to operate as fast as we can to get control of that fistula. And CO2 insufflation alone will generally collapse the lung on its own um, unless the anesthetist has to really um, bag vigorously, and then that will bring the lung up. So again, um, in neonates now, we do not do a main stem intubation for a TOF. Things like a lung biopsy you can do with CO2 insufflation, a sympathectomy, um, things where you really don't need complete collapse of the lung. I would recommend if you're doing a lobectomy that you do get lung isolation because if that lung comes up on you in the middle of your procedure, it can, it can be very difficult when you're working around the pulmonary artery and vein. Often with, with this um, single lung ventilation, we'll see an increase in uh, end tidal CO2, um, but usually just by increasing the tidal volume a little bit um, or the rate, we can usually overcome that and it's not a big problem. Um, special equipment, again, there are surgical clips that are five millimeters. Um, endo GIA and endo loops work depending on the size of the patient. Um, cautery, monopolar works. But the device you're seeing right now is the ligature, and this is the device which I think especially for pulmonary resections is key. And this device is a variation on bipolar technology using radio frequency technology uh, where it makes a seal uh, without dividing the vessel. And here you can see that I've made two separate seals and then I'm dividing the vessel um, between the seals. That way if a seal starts to fail, I have I can tell that before uh, the, the vessel is completely divided and has a chance to retract and I can have an opportunity to try and do something to correct that. But I will tell you that the new generation of the ligature, the, the failure rate for the seals is, is almost zero. The other thing the ligature is very good at is completing, is separating lung. Uh, and here we completed the major fissure and I'll show you more of that later. Uh, using it and it seals the lung very well and in fact there are now clinical trials going on 
using the ligature to do things like lung biopsy. So what are the indications for lung biopsy um, and resection? Well, interstitial lung disease, metastatic uh, cancer, uh, congenital lesions are by far what we see the most of, um, and then f infectious problems like patients who develop uh, severe bronchiectasis um, or other infectious problems. I th thought I'd just spend a minute talking about lung biopsy techniques. Lung biopsy is basic, usually a three-port technique, one for the camera, one for a grasper, and then one for um, whatever device we're going to use to perform the biopsy. And we sort of differentiate this between patients who are under 10 kilos or 10 to 15 kilos and patients who are over 10 to 15 kilos. In the larger patients, you can use an endo-GIA, and I think you're probably all familiar with that just to wedge it out, although the device is expensive. But in smaller patients, we actually use endo-loops. And again, as I mentioned, we put the patient in a lateral decubitus position. And here's just an example of using an endo-loop to do a lung biopsy. So this is a think about a nine-month-old with interstitial lung disease of unknown diagnosis. This is a PDS endoloop, and I simply just snare the piece of lung that I want to do a biopsy on uh, using the endoloop. And the endoloop, again, is just a pre-tied uh, suture ligature. Um, you can make your own if you want. And we snare it down, and I'll put two of these in sequence um, right at the base of the lung, and then I'll divide the lung um, distal to the ligatures, um, and we get an excellent specimen. This is actually a much better specimen than you would get trying to do an open lung biopsy through a mini thoracotomy, because again, you see there's very manipulation of the lung. I just grab it in one place. Uh, there's no tearing of the lung, stretching, and we get a very nice big specimen. The other nice thing is that this, this ligature is air and water tight, um, meaning that it's as secure as a staple line. And so at the end of the procedure, and I'll talk about this more this afternoon, uh, we don't leave a chest tube in. We simply inflate the lung, make sure there's not an air leak, and then we go ahead and resect, uh, go ahead and, and pull the tube when we're sure there's not an air leak before we extubate the child and wake them up. And that's because the thing that hurts the most about a thoracoscopic lung biopsy is having the chest tube in afterwards. And so the patients breathe much better and we've done that um, and had basically a zero complication rate from doing that. The other important thing, if you're going to do thoracoscopic surgery, especially if you're going to do thoracoscopic lung surgery, is you have to understand the anatomic relationships. As opposed to open surgery where we can put our hands in there and we can flip the lung back and forth, when we approach a lobectomy, you'll see that we work very much going from front to back or in one plane. So it's very important to know what structures lie behind what structures. So in this case, as this drawing illustrates, it's very important to know that uh, as the pulmonary artery um, traverses uh, the major fissure on the left side, that right behind it uh, is the bronchus, and that you can palpate that and feel it uh, with the tip of your instrument so, it, so that you know you're safe. You also need to know where the relationship of the pulmonary vein is as it comes in. Again, if you don't understand the anatomic relationships, if you're not clear on where the anatomy is, it's very hard to do thoracoscopic surgery because we lose that tactile sense. And every time you flip the lung back and forth when you're doing it thoracoscopically, you waste a lot of time and waste good exposure. Um, and so it makes the procedures much more difficult. And the same thing is true for the, uh, the, the right side, just knowing the anatomy these drawings we made up for an atlas that uh, Whit Holcomb and I and Keith Jorgensen uh, came out with about two years ago. So this is, I think, the, the biggest key. When you're dealing with a pulmonary vessel um, in the chest, the key is to have vascular control. And again, I told you I like using the ligature, ligature to do this um, because I feel very confident in the seals it promotes. But here we're dealing with the pulmonary uh, the main pulmonary artery to the um, right upper lobe and we here we see the main trunk coming off and you can see the vessel right there is probably about four to five millimeters in length in diameter and I could probably take it there and be safe but I don't have much vessel exposed and if the seal for some reason failed or I couldn't get ties or clips on it might I might bleed and I might not be able to recover so what I prefer to do is after I find the main trunk then I go and find the segmental vessels and dissect them out, especially in larger children. 
and then I'll seal each one of the segments separately. And, th and that gives me proximal and distal control because I have more length of the vessel, I have more length of the main trunk, and so if the seal fails, I have an opportunity to recover. And so here you can see I'm going to make a number of seals on the segmental vessels first. And you can see, again, this seals the vessel without dividing it. And I think that's key because if a device seals and divides at the same time and the seal fails, then the vessel retracts and immediately you can't see because of the blood and you have no opportunity to recover. And this way we'll make a number of seals. So we have a seal on the main trunk and we have a seal on the segmental vessels and we have a gap in between. And then, and you can do this with sutures, you could also do it with clips. I don't like using clips because I'm afraid I'll knock them off during the surgery. And to do it with sutures um, can be somewhat tedious, it certainly takes more time, plus you need two hands to do the suturing, so you need another port to retract the lung for you. So here I'm retracting for myself as I dissect, and you can see I'm just starting to cut across between the seals, and if there was some bleeding, I would have an opportunity to put the ligature back in or do, put a clip in or do something to stop it because the vessels don't retract and disappear. So I think that's the safest way to take a pulmonary vessel. I think one of the easiest cases to start with um, when you're doing this besides an empyema, and I think most of you are doing empyemas, is a foregut duplication, primarily because um, it's a relatively avascular structure. We use three ports. You can use hook cautery for a lot of this section. You can use the harmonic, the ligature, whatever you like. I think it's important to have something in the esophagus so that you can tell where the lumen is. And most of these patients don't have an intraluminal connection. And again, we put these patients in a modified prone position. And this is an example. So this patient is, is um, right side. We're in the, uh, in the left chest. So that's the left lower lobe. And there you can see the, um, the cyst, and it's right down on the inferior pulmonary ligament. And so we'll just use a hook cautery to separate it. And initially, the cyst looks like it's incorporated in the lung, but it's really not. It's just densely adhering to it. And again, it's just um, retracting with one hand and using the, the hook to do the dissection in the other. Um, and we just circumferentially go around the cyst. Now here you see it attached to the lung. And in this case, I'm going to use the ligature to divide it off. And I would feel very comfortable in this situation either to use the ligature or the harmonic or hook cautery. Uh, this is a different ligature device. It's called the 5. It also seals the tissue, but then it has a blade that comes out separately that if you're comfortable with the seal that you've made, you can extend the blade and it'll cut the tissues between it. Um, it's, it's not a great blade, but it works adequately. And here you can see we're just dissecting it off. And so the key here is just a, you know, very careful uh, circumferential dissection going around the cyst and gradually we'll dissect it off the lung and then we'll do the same thing in dissecting it off the esophagus. And usually the cyst will go down through the muscular wall of the esophagus, but again, uh, there's not an intraluminal connection. We've got a small hole in the cyst in this case, so some of that um, uh, mucus came out. But we just continue the dissection. Um, and, and I put a clip on it just to try and um, prevent it from leaking more. And now I'll just dissect it off the esophagus. And here you can start to see it free up. So again, it's avascular. It's very straightforward. Uh, if they've, sometimes they are chronically inflamed. or can be larger if they've been there a long time. But I think this is a very nice case to start with doing thoracoscopy. Um, PDA ligations is another procedure that I started early on. Um, and, uh, and it was actually the procedure that convinced me that I could also do a TOF because the exposure for a PDA is the same as the exposure for a uh, esophageal fistula. And it's, again, it's a three-port technique, a modified prone position. Um, and here you can see the exposure you get. So again, in this case, uh, we do have a right main stem intubation. Um, I like to do that for PDAs if the child's big enough and will tolerate it. Here you can see the, uh, the anatomy is fantastic. So there's the vagus nerve, and you'll see the recurrent laryngeal nerve coming over here in a minute. Um, we can dissect out the ductus very well. And there's the recurrent laryngeal nerve coming right in there, so you can see the nerve extremely well. There's the vagus. Here's the vagus coming around and the recurrent laryngeal. And then I usually just put a single 5-millimeter clip on it. In most cases, that's adequate. 
um, unless we're doing much larger children. Um, it's very difficult to suture these closed because it's very hard to get all the way around behind uh, the ductus um, and bring the tips of the instrument out. I can get behind it, but it would be extremely difficult to get uh, all the way around it because of the angles um, without some sort of articulating instrument, and it's really not necessary. And here you see a test occlusion. I always do this first to make sure that I am occluding what I think I am. As you know, people have ligated the pulmonary artery, the aorta, and other structures. Um, but you can see that the anatomy really is fantastic. And this operation takes uh, about, on the average, 30 minutes. And this is a 5 millimeter clip applier um, that we're just going to slide in there. And I think when you're doing this, whenever you use a clip, it's always important to preload the clip first uh, before you, um, before, you fi before you get around the structure because you can injure the structure or not get the clip in right if you do it while it's there, and that's a PDA ligation. Lobectomy, um, again, it's uh, usually a three-port technique. Um, it's very important to have, I think, the ligature, or you can use other devices. Always have a suction available in case you get into bleeding, and these are other things that you can use to do it. Um, these patients are in a lateral decubitus position, and this is just a quick example of a uh, right lower lobectomy. So again, first thing we do is insufflate with CO2. How much more time? Uh, two minutes? Okay. Um, we'll talk more about this later. But here you can see the anatomy. We can see the major fissure. First thing I like to do is take down the inferior pulmonary ligament so that I get a feel for how things are working. Then we'll go into the major fissure. Uh, and will um, expose the pulmonary artery. So here you can see I'm using the ligature to, to complete the major fissure. And then once we've done that, uh, here's it, the fissure's incomplete anteriorly as well. So again, I'll use this device to, to complete the fissure. Um, and the amazing thing is, in, in, uh, in many of these patients, and I'll show you more information this afternoon, these patients have no air leak. Um, the lung is completely sealed. And here again, you see the pulmonary artery. We're dissecting it out. You can see I've already taken the anterior basal segment right there. And now we're getting the other segmental vessels. And just in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and skip past this. This is a child with a left upper lobe cam. This had been undiagnosed prenatally. And here you can see there's these giant cysts that prevent the lung from collapsing. And so one technique I've learned to use is I'll actually use the ligature to pop the cysts to compress the lung. And once I've done that, then I have room to work. So if you have air or fluid filled structures in the chest, as opposed to laparoscopy where you create a dome and and get the abdomen to, to expand up so you have room to work. In the chest, you need to compress structures. And once we've done that, here we can take the pulmonary vein and go on and take the pulmonary artery. And then the TEF repair, again, three ports. Uh, and uh, this is the setup. And this is just a quick video of, of the TOF. And you'll hopefully get a chance to see the one we did yesterday. The one yesterday, uh, the child didn't tolerate uh, lung ventilation very well, so we had to keep letting the lung up. But the first thing I do is take the fistula, and I like using just a clip on the fistula. Um, some people have reported problems with migration or other issues. I've not had any of that problem. I think if you have the fistula dissected out well and the clip goes all the way across the fistula, you won't have a problem. Then we dissect out the upper pouch, and you can see how well you can see between the back wall of the membranous trachea and the fistula and the upper pouch so you can dissect it out. And then the most difficult part certainly is suturing it. And this is a 5-0 PDS suture that we're doing. And this is about a 1.8 kilo baby. So the space is very limited. Uh, and this is the part that just takes practice and technique. Um, we do all of our TOFs this way now. I haven't done an open TOF in about eight years. Um, and our results are excellent. Um, complications. The key to thoracoscopic surgery is avoiding complications as it is in all surgery. But the most important thing 
is avoid bleeding. If you get into any significant bleeding, you can't see, even if it's not that significant, if it wouldn't be a big deal in open surgery, it becomes a big deal in thoracoscopic surgery because you just can't see, and if you can't see, you can't operate. Air leaks are rare. Um, I've only seen one bronchopleural fistula, and we were able, actually able to go back in and repair that thoracoscopically. Esophageal leaks are rare as well. I drain all of my esophageal anastomoses uh, to make, in case there's a leak. Strictures, uh, just as in open surgery, they happen and, and can dilate it. Um, and again, CO2 retention and acidosis is generally not a big problem, although you do see an, some elevation in your end tidal CO2, um, but it's generally not a problem. The other thing is you shouldn't think of converting to open surgery as a complication. Now, I try very hard never to convert to open, and the number of times I've converted to open in the last 10 years uh, is exceedingly low. But I think, you know, the part of it's a learning curve. The only way to learn how to do this is to, to, to do more of it. And I think as long as you're safe uh, and you always do what's best for the child, for instance, in doing a TOF, if you feel you have the skills, it's not wrong to go in and do some of the dissection and then say, you know, I'm not comfortable anymore, the baby's really not tolerating it, and convert to open surgery. But you learn something every time you put a scope in. You learn um, something more about thoracoscopy. So remember, use gravity, use insufflation, uh, bribe your anesthetist so that they help you and, and don't uh, fight you. Uh, be very patient. Um, take beta blockers before you start some of these procedures to get your heart rate down. And remember, do anatomic dissections. Don't take shortcuts. Don't put an endo stapler in and go across the major fissure because you think that's the quickest, easiest thing to do. Uh, it's wrong, and you can cause a lot of problems, and uh, first do no harm. Um, thank you very much for your attention, and if there are any questions, I can try to answer them. Uh, thank you, Steve, for that wonderful introduction. I think uh, uh, the topic is very clear, and uh, we will have the questions later on when we have further discussions with you as we go through the day and later on during your lectures.